Um, Jeff has worked in computational science at the Lawrence Livermore and Lawrence Berkeley National Labs on applications ranging from high energy density physics and fusion to reactive transport and atmospheric dynamics. He has worked on several teams of various sizes and temperaments and is interested in how processes and tools can be used to help people do their jobs more effectively. So here's Jeff. Thanks, Anshu. Hi, everybody. Um, today, we're going to talk about distributed version control and continuous integration testing, and that's a lot of words. Um, and we're going to explain kind of what all these ideas mean. Um, let me just. So first, we're going to go over what exactly version control is and why we care about it. Um, there's a different kinds of version control that have developed over the years, uh, centralized and distributed version control, and they're pretty different. And it's likely that uh, some or all of you will have some experience with one or the other um, and have biases about which you like better and all that. But we're going to try and explain the difference between them and the, the central concepts. Um, Git is a distributed version control tool that has become very popular nowadays. And uh, so I'm going to go over some of the basic ideas behind it and uh, show you how it's being used. And the popularity of Git has actually given rise to, to a pretty productive ecosystem of software development in industry. And GitHub is an example of one of these development platforms that we're going to discuss uh, that is helping software teams be more productive. And uh, while we're not all industrial grade software development teams, there are a lot of uh, ideas that we can adopt from those efforts. And so we're gonna discuss platforms like GitHub. Um, these platforms offer you a lot of services kind of out of the box for tracking progress on your work and prioritizing issues. And it also uh, has given us some high level tools for controlling how we make changes to code in the form of, uh, for example, pull requests. And so we're going to go over that stuff. And finally, I'm going to give you an idea of uh, something called continuous integration, which is a mechanism for making sure that you never break your code, or at least in the, in the ideal world. There is a procedure that will allow you to minimize the amount uh, of damage that you do your software as you change it. And I hope that that is an interesting idea for everybody. So there's quite a lot of stuff here. Firstly, I'm not going to teach you everything about Git. I know that uh, this talk was partially sold as, oh, well, you want to learn about Git. Well, we're going to explain everything here. It's impossible to explain Git in an hour to uh, a, a crowd of people with various degrees of ex experience uh, and no real two-way communication. Um, and I don't even think that would be a particularly interesting talk for everybody. So, uh, so that's not what this talk is about. I'm also not going to give you a translation chart from Subversion to Git. Um, I know this is what a lot of people want when they're coming from a centralized uh, version control system like Subversion and being introduced to Git. And I'm, I hope that one of the things I'm going to convince you of is that there is no translation chart from Subversion to Git. The ideas are, are basically different um, in the two systems. That said, you, you should be able to, to learn one even if you are familiar with the other uh, and used to the, the one way of doing business. And finally, I'm not going to tell you how you should be running your projects um, because we're all doing different work and I don't know what, what the important things are for you. I'm just going to give you some ideas to work with. I will attempt to convince you that you need to use version control for your software projects if you're not convinced of this already. And that's sort of the first order of business. I'm also going to dump a bunch of links and resources on you so that if I succeed in interesting you in version control, if you're not already familiar with it, you'll have lots of stuff to play with. Um, beyond that, I'm, I'm going to show you some examples of software development processes that people have been pretty successful in deploying. I'm not going to advocate for every one of these processes. They're, they're as different as the teams that undertake them and, and teams with different resources and different needs have different strategies that work. I'm just hoping to paint a picture of the landscape for you. And finally, from my perspective, the point of this talk is to show you something you haven't seen before. Uh, and the reason for that is that this webinar covers a lot of ground. 
this is an area of software engineering that isn't really part of the formal training of most computational scientists. In fact, computational scientists, it's, it's relatively recently that we've had any sort of formal training in our field. A lot of us, especially my age group, came from other sciences, other areas in science. My background is actually in physics, and I got into computation because there are an increasing number of problems that obviously computers can help us solve, and many of the obstacles in doing better science have turned out to be engineering obstacles, as in how, how do we get this code to work? It's now gotten to a, a very complicated state where it can solve very elaborate problems, but if you don't know whether it's working properly, then you, know, you might just be generating pretty pictures that don't have any actual scientific content in them at the, at the end of the day. And that's, just, that's even if your code even runs after you've uh, worked on it for long enough. I also don't know what everybody here who is listening knows uh, because of this very broad background or set of backgrounds that we all come from. So there's just a set of ideas that I would like to make sure that somebody has exposed to you. And so I really don't want people to worry about absorbing all of this. Um, the slides are going to be available. I hope that they'll be a good resource for those of you who haven't seen uh, some of this material. And there are going to be some of you who have seen most of this material, and uh, I, I just hope it's not too boring in that case. All right. So to start, version control is something I believe is essential to software development. Um, actually, I should ask, are there any questions at this point based on? We've got one. OK. Um, OK. Person says, I have been using Subversion and Git for quite a while now. On this note, therefore, is there anything I should know about uh, Mercurial yes. to either reinforce what I use or be more informed about what it lacks? Okay, so that's, that's a good question. Um, you're going to get something out of this, I think. Um, if you're using Git already and, uh, and you're curious about Mercurial, they've got very similar feature sets, and we'll go into that a little bit. Uh, but I, I don't think that you, I think if you're successfully using Subversion and, and Git, you're getting most of the story. Um, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about how tools, what tools can do for you and what they can't. Um, and so the differences between tools, I think, become less important if you're, if you're doing the important things. Okay, so version control. Uh, it's also called source code control, revision control, source code versioning. It has a lot of names, but the name we're going to use to discuss uh, the, the storage of software codes in repositories that are available to all the contributors and shared and, and whose contents are controlled and labeled by version numbers uh, is version control. It's been used by software developers for decades in various forms. The idea is that you put your source code somewhere where everybody can get to it and where the, the process of making changes to that software is controlled in some way that allows everybody else to share in those changes and everybody uh, works with a consistent version of the code. Um, and developers make changes, incorporate changes from others or external uh, collaborators and they merge their changes into one master version of code in one or more repositories. In broad terms, a computational scientist can think of a repository with their source code as their laboratory notebook. Um, and this puts us into familiar territory with the scientific method. You write down what you do, you try to understand uh, the processes you've been following, and you try and make it so that somebody else can reproduce your results. The point of version control is establishing a common context for code contributions and the exchange of ideas. Um, this is important because if you have more than one person working on a, a software project and you guys are discussing code, you really want to make sure you're discussing the same code. Because if you're not, I mean, communication is hard enough. We talk past each other all the time. But if you're looking at different code, you're going to have even more misunderstandings than you would ordinarily have in a technical conversation. Um, it also establishes a chronological sequence of events. Changes come before or after other changes. You can move forward and back in time to try and figure out 
uh, how a change affected the code, where a bug was introduced, where it was fixed, and all that. Um, this idea of serving as the ground truth for a software project is is what we were what I was talking about in terms of talking about one set of source code. Hey, let's look at this specific version of the code. Go to this line at uh, of of this file so we can both discuss um, a change that we are proposing to make or uh, a feature of this algorithm in here. If you don't have a common reference for your source code, then you can't really have a meaningful discussion. And a corollary of that is that results from code that doesn't come from a repo that is understood in terms of, th that is versioned, you can't reproduce them. And so to people trying to adhere to the scientific method, those results are not interesting. And more people in science are using version control uh, than, than used to be the case. Uh, and I think that's a great thing just because if we're actually talking about doing science, we need to, to back up our, our claims with actions that show that we're doing something that is reproducible. Um, some people have historically, and some still do, I'm sure, share code with file sharing or, or tolerables. And if you want an idea of how this can go wrong, um, I was going to think of an elaborate example, but I think something that we've all had experience with it at this point is trying to share uh, a document and get people's input into it. And so you've probably had a few frustrating document sharing experiences where somebody creates a new version of a document with their changes. And at the same time, somebody creates another version of a document with, with their different changes and the changes conflict and everybody's versioning system for how they rename the document is inconsistent. And so if you want an example of what can go wrong with sharing code using just sharing files and passing them around an email or, uh, or on Dropbox or something, just take that experience and imagining it continuing for months or years uh, with a changing cast of characters contributing to the documents in an ever-expanding set of documents. It doesn't work. It's, it's really challenging to, to do document sharing the old-fashioned way uh, now that we all have more sophisticated sharing mechanisms that allow us to actually collaborate and communicate about our changes and, and make annotations. Um, and developing software that works is much harder than, you know, writing a document. So, so this, is, this is a recipe for disaster. Version control is designed to make sharing code easy. So with a repository that you're developing in, the repository or your workspace um, in the repository, you can communicate with the repository to find out exactly what version of your code that you're looking at. There's a unique identifier that identifies each change, um, either per file or per uh, the entire code. Um, you'll have a unique identifier for some portion of the code that allows you to see what it is you're looking at. And if you've made any local uh, edits to those files on your machine that make them different from the version that everybody else is looking at, the repository can also tell you what the changes those are. Um, and so with those two pieces of information, everybody who's using the repository can actually agree on whether they're looking at the same thing. And if there are conflicts, your system will tell you about them and it'll still be up to you to resolve them. The tool can make it easier to merge conflicts, but people on a team um, collaborators of any sort have to agree on how to resolve these conflicts. That's some, not something that a tool can do for you. Okay. Are there any questions at this, this point? Okay. I'm not being too controversial, I guess. You might ask, Jeff, what if I'm developing software by myself? Um, I've been talking about teams, but you know, we do our own projects and, and so what do I, do I even bother with this stuff? Well, Remember, we talked about version control uh, being a laboratory notebook for computational scientists. So if you want people believing uh, the work that you do, it helps to have a record of your changes that you've made and results uh, that stem from a specific version number. Um, it's also nice for you to have kind of a chronology of your development work so that you can understand uh, what it is that you're currently working on and you can remember, you know, after a really great weekend, for example, 
uh, the issues that you were facing um, last Friday. You know, if you also uh, a mechanical benefit is that if you're developing your software on more than one machine, you need to keep it consistent across those machines. And if you're just kicking files back and forth to yourself via email, uh, it's very easy for your your versions of your code to get out of sync in very um, esoteric ways. Finally, if you want to collaborate with something for with another person on a piece of software, you're now in the same boat as a software team. Even if it's not a, a formal collaboration, you're going to have all the same problems uh, with working with a group of people. And given how uh, how much of our science work these days is is interdisciplinary or just a lot of work or uh, collaborative in nature with people different different areas of overlapping but not overlaid expertise, uh, you don't want your tools to be an obstacle to collaboration. So the simplest version control systems are those that are centralized in which there's one single repository that contains the master version or the trunk of the source code. And the idea is that everybody who works on a software project with a centralized repository synchronizes their workspaces with this repository, checks out files, changes them, and then commits changes. And as soon as somebody commits a set of changes to, to files, everybody else who has access to the repository sees them once they synchronize with that repository. And people have to cooperate with each other in order to make sure that changes they, they commit to the repository don't conflict with each other. It's a very simple system, but it's limited in that it's all the changes that you make to the repository are immediately visible to others. It's hard to make a, a large set of changes that is controlled without interfering with other people. And, and so uh, there's this idea of developing in, in different branches that has become more popular that if I wanna do some work on my own, try out an experimental idea, and I want to use version control to do it, I would, uh, the, the jargon is cut a development branch to try out an idea, make several commits in that branch without being, without interacting with other people and, uh, and try and figure out whether my idea has any merit and toss out the branch if it doesn't or merge the branch into the main, the mainline development trunk or master version if it does. And most centralized systems like the ones I've written here don't allow the creation of development branches. Now everybody's gonna jump down my throat and say that Subversion does allow branching. And I'm here to say, no, it doesn't. You, it fakes branching because it allows you to make copies of the entire repo and label them as, as a branch. But if you notice that when you create a Subversion branch, you're actually just using the copy command, uh, that should tell you that, that branching was an afterthought um, after Subversion was already established. This, this may not matter for, for folks, but if you're not used to using uh, branching, you know, Perforce is an example of a, a version control system that actually is centralized and uses branching. And if you've never had a tool that's good at branching before, you don't really know what you're missing. Um, so the, the, the point to these systems is that they're simple but limited. You need a lot of coordination to keep people from stepping on each other's toes. And so here's a schematic. This isn't a great picture in terms of, it, it's, it's a little bit rasterized, it's low resolution, but I feel like it was, a, it was a pretty good diagrammatic representation of a centralized repository. You have one repository um, that people on different workstations are, are looking at, and the interactions for the repository consist of commits made from people's workstations, um, and updates that synchronize changes from other people's changes uh, to the repository to everybody. So everybody is constantly in communication with each other. Very simple, um, but requires coordination. More recently, so, so the amount of coordination required with the simple centralized version control systems has given rise to the idea of distributed version control. And this is this is kind of a, a bit of a radical departure from the centralized model in that everybody has a copy of the entire repo in its history. And there is by convention, a main repo that has the real version in it, but there is nothing in the tool that says that that's the main repo. That's just the one that everybody 
that's the one containing everybody's work that, that your final product ends up in. Um, and the idea here is that people typically work in branches uh, that within their repos, in, and there are various ways of doing this, with sets of changes that are isolated from other people's changes until you explicitly decide to, to merge your changes together. You have a question? So someone asked, what is proper procedure for requesting a pull request? Okay, so this is good. So we have people who are into some of the more advanced ideas. We will get there. Um, and I, I, if, I, I apologize if I'm boring, boring anybody. I'm just trying to lay out language, but we will talk about pull requests later in the talk. Um, so, so just sit tight and I'll, I'll try and get there. Um, the distributed version control systems have greater flexibility because you can kind of create a, a variety of workflows with them, but they're also more complicated and there is a learning curve uh, and that is sometimes perceived as a turnoff to these systems. Um, but I'm here to convince you that that there are ways of learning it. So here's a, here's a diagram of distributed version control. You can see that there are several repositories. There's one at the top that is by convention, the, the main repository. And it interacts with these other repositories with these push and pull actions, which are synchronization operations between repositories for individual developers and the mainline version. And each developer is one of these ovals at the bottom who is working with an entire repository in its history and the working copy is just the the workspace that you're working in that you would treat as in the same way as as a centralized repository in a centralized version control system and so there's this theorem in computer science uh, that every problem can be solved with a layer of indirection and distributed version control is is just a manifestation of that theorem in computer science that well maybe we can get rid of all of this uh, tightly coupled uh, coordination by introducing a layer of abstraction. And that abstraction is the separation of uh, repositories and the coordination of, of different repositories instead of having one big shared repository. And so we can get into this more very soon. Git and Mercurial are the most popular DCVS tools, distributed, uh, oh, sorry, DVCS tools. Um, they have very similar feature sets, but their user interfaces are very different. Git was written by Linus Torvalds, the guy who, who made Linux. And if you've ever seen Linus Torvalds give a talk, he's very opinionated. He hated subversion because of the, the amount of coordination and uh, stepping on of toes involved in, uh, in the centralized version control that subversion implemented. And he set out to write a replacement for it that does not reward anybody for having experience with subversion. And this is kind of a controversial thing that he did because he was basically writing off anybody's experience with subversion because he thought it was just a piece of garbage. And I'm not here to tell you that subversion is a piece of garbage. I'm just saying, if you're wondering why uh, you're coming from a subversion background and Git seems alien to you, it's because the author of Git, uh, if anything, did did no work to make it easy to adopt Git from there. On the other hand, Mercurial is a, is a distributed version control system that caters to subversion veterans, tried to make it easier for them to adopt. And so its approach is more ease of use um, and familiarity with prior tools. And they've really got similar sets of features. Git is a little bit more well organized because it didn't accommodate the the uh, workflows that were present in Subversion and, and CVS and RCS. And so it actually got to start with a cleaner slate. And, and so I think it's a more powerful tool, uh, but it requires you to put in more time to learn. And so whether you use one or the other, you're, you're really getting similar capabilities, but there are some things that Git is better at. There's some things that Mercurial is, is better at. And uh, if, if you use either of these, you're doing okay. In that vein, you have to remember a version control tool is just a tool. It's not going to do your job for you. It's not going to allow you to write code without communicating with others. And by others, I include something I'll call future you, which is you after a great relaxing vacation um, where you don't remember what you were doing before, 
or future you after six months of working on other projects and coming back to this thing we were working on. Um, future you is, is a version of you that if you've, if you've ever been fu future you relative to present you, you know the value of leaving breadcrumbs uh, to help you figure out later down the line what you were doing. Um, and a tool will not do that. You, you have to actually pay attention to giving cues to other developers, including future you, uh, as to what it is that you're doing. It also doesn't define a process for developing software by yourself or on a team, right? The tool will just, it, it contains certain primitive operations that it can do, but it doesn't define a procedure by itself. Um, you, if you're working alone, or your team should choose an approach based on what you need and based on who is on your project and, and their skill set and their tolerance for learning uh, software engineering techniques based on, you know, we're, we're in the scientific community and so we don't just get to, to write software all the time. The software has to do something that yields better science. And so there's a balance between procedure and engineering and, uh, and getting a job done and you have to pay attention to that. I think one of the reasons that distributed version control systems are interesting is because they can accommodate a very wide range of approaches to software development. But for some teams, um, centralized version control is still gonna be more attractive. So this is just another, I, I'm kind of banging this into the ground. You need to think about your process uh, on a software team uh, because different teams have different needs. Some things should be easy um, things that happen often, and some things can be more complicated um, and happen more rarely. How often you release software to the public, uh, how often you interact with customers, all of these things uh, determine what should be easy and what should be hard in, in your process. And uh, you can get this by using tools, but the tools themselves will not dictate processes for you. So later on, I'll, I'll talk about different processes that have evolved um, for people using Git and GitHub and these things that we're going to discuss. So let's talk about Git. Um, I don't know how many of you have used it before, um, but if you have put in any time with it, you know the command syntax can be pretty confusing if you've used something else. Um, there's a big cultural disconnect between people who are Git experts and people who are new to Git and sometimes the Git experts get very excited about uh, things like the DAG, which is the, the, the graph representation of the repository history. And so they'll just launch into a, a talk on the DAG and everybody will be wondering what the heck that is. Um, and so the, the challenge is trying to find a common language to discuss these ideas without sacrificing um, the, the notion of elegance in these concepts. Um, and that's, that's really what requires the time to be put in, is that it's hard to understand what Git is doing if you don't know a few of the underlying concepts. Also, it's worth knowing that if you have a team, um, the, the most successful adoption of Git that I've seen in several cases um, are those teams that actually train one or two Git people. Like, hey, you guys, please go learn about Git and tell, us, tell the rest of us what is going on. Uh, that, it's enough of an investment that not everybody has time to learn everything, but if you have one person who goes deep on it, they're, they're able to help out the team and, and become a resource. Uh, whatever you're doing, Git can help you do it, and it always works. If you learn how to use Git, it's usually easy to fix mistakes if you find them early, and we can talk about how, how Git uh, can be used to, to find mistakes. Something that confuses a lot of people is that Git performs operations in a way that they're not left in an intermediate state. Um, for example, when you, when you uh, merge two branches together in Git, the, it will automatically commit the merge if nothing went wrong. And this is, this is a big difference between Git and Mercurial and the way that, that merging of uh, fake branches and subversion works. That your, it's your responsibility to actually commit the merge in the other two. And Git, if it finishes without conflicts, will we'll do it for you. That's actually a great thing because it means that your repository goes from a working state to another working state. Git, as, as you'll see, can support 
arbitrarily elaborate workflows, and that might not sound like a benefit, but for large team efforts with tens or hundreds of people interacting with each other, it's very helpful to be able to create uh, more elaborate processes that will actually allow people to, to control changes in, in more minute fashions. Okay, uh, question. Some people say, well, I don't distribute software and we're a small team. Uh, Git's version Mercurial isn't for me. How do you convince them? Oh, so you're saying that version control isn't for me. Um, I won't believe in your results if you don't use version control. Um, also, I know several people who have accidentally deleted all their files and lost all their work. And maybe if you're working on, on your, your workstation at work, somebody has backed up the files for you. Uh, and that, you know, backups are not a strong case for using version control, but the, I would say you're not going to be taken seriously by anybody who actually produces working software. If you can't actually point to a version that you used to get your results, that's, that's the biggest scientific case I can say for, for using it. Other than that, I would love to see how they um, communicate if, if they're just a small team, how they communicate about their software if they're passing it around uh, with tarballs. Because that quickly, it, in periods of activity where people are touching the same files, you know, I, 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 would, I guess my, my retort to them would be, how's that working out for you? And, and I don't think it'd be that many questions before I, I uncovered some issues. Um, once you know what you're doing in Git, it doesn't get in your way. It doesn't tell you what to do. It might not feel like this early on, but it's really true that Git allows you to do exactly what you're doing. And it's actually easier to learn Git and, and distributed uh, version control systems in general if you haven't used Subversion or C CVS. And so some of the prejudices that you adopt in using centralized version control actually make it harder for you to adopt some of these newer approaches. Sounds weird. There's a lot of nouns and verbs to do with Git um, and with distributed version control systems in general, and here are some of them. There are repositories, repos, which we've talked about. Um, making a copy of a repo to, to work on involves cloning repos. You can uh, make commits or you can commit changes within repos. That's how you change your code. You can create branches for doing isolated development, not isolated development for six months at a time, but development that involves a, um, a coherent idea or feature or feature set that, uh, that you would like to be merged into your code base as, as a, a coherent entity. There are remotes, which are other repos that you, you synchronize to. So the master repo um, that nobody works directly in is is a remote repo as far as everybody else's uh, repos are concerned because you do your work in your repo, I do my work in my repo, and that work is merged in the master repo, which we both refer to as a remote, and we'll, we can get into this. Pulls and pushes involve moving changes between repos or remotes. Um, revisions are the same as they are in Subversion or, or CVS, they are just, unique change numbers um, in get their unique hashes. They're not ordered like they are in Subversion or RCS. Um, and each change that is made to a repo gives you a unique um, hash code that is um, pretty enormous, but, but that has an abbreviation that's usually seven uh, alphanumeric characters long and uniquely identifies uh, a change. You're always working in a workspace within your repo. Uh, Git has a formal idea called the index for that. I'm not gonna talk about the index because that's, that's more advanced or intermediate Git. And finally, there's the notion of the history or the graph or what Git aficionados call the DAG, the directed acyclic graph. And I don't know, frankly, for mere mortals, how important it is to call out that the graph is directed or acyclic. Um, because it, that, it, that's the most intuitive type of graph that, that there is if, you, if you're not a graph theory expert. So I'm gonna try some interactive stuff with you guys. I wonder how this is gonna work. Um, 
here are some commands you can actually open up if you have a, a window or if you have a Windows laptop with PowerShell or if you have uh, a Linux or Mac laptop with just the terminal. These are commands you can actually type in to see how Git works. And so you can, for example, make an example directory and change to it. And you can populate two files, A and B, with some simple text. And then you can make sure that those files exist by typing ls. And then you can initialize a Git repository consisting of, uh, that, that is based in this directory. And you can ask Git with Git status, what did I just do? What is in this repository? Tell me what's going on. So for the next several slides, uh, feel free to follow along in, in the shell. I would like to, th those people who haven't done this before, to actually give this a try because um, you should actually see how this feels. It's, it's one thing to watch somebody else do this, but I think getting this through your fingers will, will, will be helpful. So I, I hope that this isn't too tedious. Um, are there any questions at this point? Or? No. All right. So, so consider doing this. I'm going to move on to the next one. If you noticed, if, if you typed git status, you, you would see that uh, git has told you that there are files in the repository that aren't part of the repository's contents yet. And so we have these files A and B, and you can add them. And after you add each one, you can ask git via git status, what did I just do? What happened? Right? And git will say, oh, well, you added A and you added B, but you haven't actually committed them yet. So he's asking what if git comes with all Linux distributions by default? Uh, it should. Yeah, generally it does. Uh, generally it's kind of an old version. Yeah, and we're, nothing that we're doing um, relies on new versions of, of Git. There are big differences. There are good reasons to use latest versions of, of Git. Um, but we're not going to rely on any of the differences between them. These are all basic, basic Git commands. Um, and in fact, it comes with uh, Mac OS too. I, I, I don't know about Windows. So what we're doing here is, is we're adding some files. We're asking Git what, what it is that we're doing. And we're going to do our first commit of these files. Hey, Git, please, uh, please track these files from now on. The am flags for the commit command consist of a, a means commit all the files that I have added or modified in this repository. And m means here's a commit message. Here's a, a message describing um, what is in this commit. And so this, we're just saying this is the first commit. It's not a very informative message, but uh, this is just for illustrative purposes anyway. And after you type get status again, you'll see that you've got a repository that is uh, up to date, that you haven't made any local changes to your files since the last commit, and that's just because the last thing you did was you, you did this commit. Right, so now you can change these files. You can add some extra stuff to file A, just to add, concatenate it onto the end using the echo, echo command. And then, this is kind of interesting, you, you ask get status, what happened? And it said, well, A is different. And you, if you wanna see the differences in your local directory, you can type get diff. And it will actually give you a synopsis of what you've changed in, in the syntax of the diff tool, which anybody who's been using Unix uh, for long enough will recognize. And maybe you, maybe you didn't want extra stuff like you, you concatenated to A. Maybe you wanted a capital X. So um, on a per file basis, you can revert the changes that you made to A in the same way you would use SVN revert or mercurial revert actually also does this. You'd say get checkout a and that what that does is that checks out a fresh copy of a from the repository and then you check with git status again what what is going on and it says well nothing's different from the last commit because the one change you made you you blew over um, now you can do that capital x version that you you always wanted to do and you can commit that change and you can say that this there's extra stuff in the file a right so at each point, we're able to make a change, and we're actually able to ask Git 
what what is going on and that's this is i think the single most important thing about version control is you can actually communicate with the system whose job it is to to keep track of all the changes that you make to your software it's a, a version of objective reality for people who collaborate on software to have uh, substantive arguments about what what is uh, in the source code now you'll notice you've committed twice you can ask git to tell you what has has gone on in the history of this code because it now has a history you type git log and you'll see your two commits and you'll see that the commits have unique hashes that are ridiculously long uh, strings of alphanumeric characters and you can even ask Git to render a pictorial representation by putting dash dash graph after uh, Git log. You'll notice the, the long dashes that show up in these fonts, that for some reason they merge them, um, they're double dashes. And the last commit that you made the, uh, is, is something that has a special name called capital, all caps, head. That is, uh, if you like, it's a pointer to the most recent activity in your repository history or in, in the graph, um, in the jargon of, of Git. So you can actually ask Git to show you the most recent commit by typing git show all caps head, and it'll say, okay, well, here's what you did in that last commit. You can actually use uh, a tilde syntax to step backwards in time and say, show me the one before that. So start at head and go backwards one, and, and uh, get show head tilde one will show you first commit you made, which is also the penultimate commit you made, you know? Um, and if, it, now, suppose that, that you didn't actually want that most recent commit after all, you can actually ask get to pretend that it never happened. And this is not something that, that you want to do all the time, but it's a, it's a useful enough feature that you'll eventually come to understand why this is a nice tool to have. You can say, get, can you reset the state of the repo to the commit before the last one and pretend that that last commit never happened? And you do this by saying get reset dash dash hard and I, I'm not going to explain in detail what this means. It has to do with the index, which we're not talking about. And at some point, you, know, you guys are, are realizing that there are a lot of underlying concepts for Git, but you don't need to know them all to be productive in it. And so what that will do is it'll effectively just erase the last commit, and it'll reset the head pointer to the first commit, which is the only commit in your history. You can type git log, and you see that that, that is the case. So I hope some people are following along with this. Um, even if you're not, try this stuff after the webinar. You know, this is a good exercise uh, that, that doesn't involve a lot of uh, external tools, and I think it'll give you a good idea of what is going on. We talked about branches. Now you get to make your own new branch. We're going to make a branch called New A um, because we want to change A, but we want to, to control the changes that we're making without uh, without working in in the master development branch, so we're gonna we're gonna work in isolation on uh, a new version of the A file. And so what we're gonna do is we're going to create a new branch called new A, and you do that with git branch new A. And now I want to call to your attention something that if you type git status, you are not going to uh, that that you're going to still be on the master branch, which is by default the branch that you're, you work on in Git, which is the mainline development branch. And you'll see that Git status reports that you are on the master branch. So you haven't changed the new branch um, by default. You can type Git branch if you just wanna know what branch you're on, and it'll also print out other branches that you have in your local workspace. To change to the new A branch, you type Git checkout, and now you can type git status and it'll reflect the fact that you're on the new A branch. Then you can dump some new stuff into the A file. Do git diff to make sure that that stuff actually uh, is, is pending as an update to the file and do a commit and then do a log uh, to look at the history. And this new A branch has a distinct history from the master branch of development. 
And this is a powerful feature because you can do lots of work without disturbing other people, even who are who have activity going on in, in the same repository, um, because their development history will uh, depend on the branch that they're in. So you can actually do a certain amount of work and then decide when to merge your changes with other people. This is this is a huge advantage of distributed version control systems. Now, suppose you want to merge the new A branch into the master branch. You switch back to the master branch by typing get checkout master. Use get status whenever you want. Um, it'll, it'll report that you're on the master branch. You can type get log to verify that the history of the master branch doesn't have the latest commit you put into new A in it. And then you can perform the merge with the get merge new A command that says take the branch that I'm on, namely the master branch in this case, and merge the new A branch that I created into it. And if you type get log, you'll now see that new commit. And you'll notice that you didn't have to commit the merge, that the merge just took two branches with commits uh, of changes in them and merged them together. So what about merged conflicts? Uh, so merged conflicts work largely the same way that they do in other things. If, if there were conflicts, if you had two, if you changed the file A in the master branch directly and then you made a conflicting change in your new A branch, you would see um, a merge tool, usually your text editor of choice, so the, the, you, know, you can set it up in, in Unix to be the all caps editor environment variable, but you can also set up merge tools to uh, allow you to pick the, the master version or the new A version of, of the merge. Every version control system has to deal with conflicts and, and Git is no different but you have to know what it is that you want. So there is always going to be an interactive element of, of merging. And so I, I don't wanna go into that so much, but there are a lot of nice uh, tools out there that can get as graphical or as uh, programmatic as you like for resolving merges. Um, that, but, but you would interact with it. If there were conflicts, get merge new A would not automatically commit the merge because there, there would be nothing valid to automatically commit. It would tell you, hey, there were conflicts, um, and you can actually, if you set up a merge tool within Git, there is a command called git merge tool that allows you to open up whatever fancy tool uh, you want to use to select these, these or those changes. Um, so at this point, if you followed along, you've, you've merged in the, the branch new A, you can use git log to see that indeed your latest change is now in the master branch. So you don't need the new A branch anymore, so you can delete it. And to delete the branch, you use git branch dash D new A. Um, and then, so we have a follow up question about merging. Is it safer to merge using tools or will merging work with conflict using the terminal command prompt? Well, you need some sort of, you're gonna have to edit files. If you, if you wanna do it manually, um, there is a kind of a universal merge syntax that has to do with diff that will let you know uh, the, the branch you were on has these changes, has these lines in this file, which conflicts with the branch that you're merging in, which has these changes, um, which do you want? And if you, if you do it manually, you go into your editor and you will delete one of those sets of changes and there'll be little left arrows and, and right arrows, little greater than and less than that will demarcate those different sets of changes. It's manual. Some people like doing that because they're just used to that syntax. If, you, if that makes you uncomfortable, you should find a, a tool that will allow you to do it more automatically. But I'm not gonna tell you you need a big fancy graphical tool. I mean, everybody works their own way. So, so play around with that. You know, you can actually elaborate on this example to introduce conflicts into the A file or the B file or, or both and play around with things. And if you get messed up, you can, also, you can always use get reset with that hard flag to go back to pretend, dear git, pretend this never happened. Um, let's just never discuss this again. Okay, another question. Has there ever been a case when version control become big data itself that requires a dedicated resource to manage it? Yes, this is a great question. So git manages uh, changes in files as, uh, as deltas or, or just diffs, really. 
And this is great for text, but it is lousy for data. And so if you put binary data into a, a Git repository, this is actually one case in which Git is, is much worse than Subversion and other tools because the, the things that make Git changes so efficient to store make it horrible for storing binary files. And so people don't like to put binary files in Git repositories. So, for, so you, you shouldn't store data in these repositories. There are tools like Git Annex um, and, and others that allow you to interface with version control for data files. Um, but if you actually do ignore this advice and you do uh, check in a PDF file that has a thousand versions, um, or, or you check in large mesh files if you do simulations or, or large data files, the repositories can quickly um, mushroom in size. And I don't know, you know, we all have our own definition for what big data is, but the, if big data is data that needs to be managed with special care and attention, yes, you, you will certainly get there. Um, Git also lets you just check out the last N commits, you know, 50, 100, to your repository. So if you have uh, some of the other people in the, the DOE Ideas project work on a project called Trilinos, which is a very large software project, and their Git repository is too big um, in practice uh, for, for them to check out all the time, they can tell Git, please just get me the, the history that has the last 100 commits for this because it's gotten too big. Um, and so there's in any version control uh, system or any database that has a cumulative history, you're going to run into this problem eventually. So we do what we can. Don't put binary files in, in Git. It's a bad idea. Um, there are solutions. There's nothing that is turnkey perfect at this point that doesn't cost money, uh, but that it's a problem that people are very interested in. So that is a great question. All right. So you remember this diagram, this slightly rasterized diagram uh, that has repositories in it. I want to talk about remotes um, because all of the changes that we've done, all of the exercises that we've done are, are on your own repository in your own workspace. If you wanted to push your changes to a repository so that other people could see them, um, you would need to set up a remote. And so you see these repositories um, that have pushes and pulls between them. To any one of those repositories, the others are all remotes. Um, and you can only push or pull uh, between repositories that can refer to each other. And how do you do that? Well, this won't work because example.com is a fake web address. Um, but when we talk about GitHub very shortly, um, we'll, we'll get into the idea of remotes. Your, your repo, your Git workspace, has its notion of remotes that it can refer to. And if you type git remote-v, that will give you a list of all the remotes that you can pull or push from, and it should be empty. And you can add a new remote, and how you do that is you type git remote add, you give a name to your remote, like upstream, for example, stuff that, that you look at when you're looking at the real version, or origin is the one that GitHub uses. Um, and you give it a, a URL that identifies a web address where, or, or a SSH address or whatever it is uh, that identifies a file containing the re repository. You can also add a downstream one. Um, if, if you have some elaborate topology that uh, allows your team to collaborate with each other or you do staging for production releases or development releases, this is a whole new space of, of uh, issues that you have to think about. But the way that you do it mechanically is you manipulate these remotes by adding them. You can delete them too. Um, the git remote command has all sorts of options to it. And then you can pull changes from a repository, which will involve, depending on the branch that you're on, you, you pull changes uh, between branches on repositories. And if there are conflicts in the, the merges that result from those pulls, which are basically synchronization operations, you can use your merge tool to pick through those. And otherwise, it will just commit, make, it will commit all the changes that will resolve your uh, repository with the one that you pulled from. In the same way, if you push changes to another repository, uh, those changes will be reflected 
if the if the histories are incompatible, you won't be able to do a push. Um, you can only resolve merge conflicts in polls, and the reasons for that become obvious when you think about how much uh, power you should have to inconvenience other people and make their lives miserable. Um, okay, so it's a really good time to learn Git uh, right now. Here are some some various resources. Uh, a lot of them are interactive. Um, please check them out. Here are some some books you can read online that uh, operate at various levels. Um, I'm just going to dump these resources on you. There's various tools that make uh, various parts of the project uh, or parts of Git easier to use on various operating systems or with various editors. Um, finally, you don't have to do this in a vacuum, right? You should check out offerings in your local community. There's a lot of software engineering boot camps these days. There are workshops and conferences you can check out. If you're at a university, your CS department would probably love to talk your ear off about this stuff. You don't have to learn it by yourself. So the, the other thing I want to talk about is GitHub very briefly. Uh, you can surf to it at github.com. There are free repositories offered for open source projects. They're offered in terms of these remotes that, that you can sync by pulling and pushing to your own repository. And it implements a lot of helpful process building blocks like pull requests, which, which we're going to talk about uh, briefly, and uh, forks, which are just fancy ways of, of making copies of repos. And they also include some simple uh, nice tools. They also integrate with several project management tools. Um, and this isn't very interesting for people who aren't on larger teams. But you might have heard of Jira, Confluence, Slack, HipChat, uh, team communication tools. And Travis CI, which is a, a continuous integration tool that hopefully I'll, I'll have time to, to discuss very briefly. You don't have to use GitHub. You can use Bitbucket or GitLab. They're basically the same. They differ in how uh, their payment plans are organized. Um, and what kind of integrations with these other tools they offer. Um, they offer some, some creature comforts like issue tracking, which I'll, I'll show you very briefly, um, and forks and pull requests, which I, I guess I'm just going to show you how this stuff works. So if you want to, go ahead and surf to this, uh, this example repository. And if you're uh, comfortable using Git on the command line, you can even clone it with the command at the bottom of the window. Um, so I'm going to go duck into this repository and show you uh, uh, an issue tracker that's built into it. So I'm, I'm going to try and do this. So here's the example repository on GitHub. Can everybody see this OK? We're going to go to the set of issues, which doesn't exist because this, this repository is just the two files I was telling you about, A and B. Um, you can create a new issue in here. This repo needs more stuff, right? And that, that's a bug because we just don't have enough stuff in the repo. And I guess we're running out of time. Anyway, I know I spent more time on the mechanics of, of Git than I wanted to. Um, and so I don't know if we have, hold on one second. So. So we're finding out whether we can actually keep this room any longer. So can we keep going? Or? Okay. All right. We're going to try and keep on going a little bit longer because uh, I talked too long about the mechanics of Git, which is uh, one of those one of those things that happens when you're talking about this stuff. Um, what we just did was we just added an issue to the issue tracker in the example repo 
that now appears as an issue. So this is a great way of keeping track of bugs or feature requests in your software project. And I'm not going to go into great detail about this. You should definitely check out this repo um, and add issues if you want. Another thing you can do if you're looking at that page, and especially if you, if you are feeling brave and you want to make a GitHub account yourself right now, you can create a fork of that repo, which is effectively your own copy of, of the software project on GitHub. And that is very useful if, if you don't have right access to the repo, but you wanted to get me a change, you could fork this, this repo on GitHub, make your changes, and then ask me to incorporate your changes with a pull request, which I'll explain next. You have it? Yeah, yeah, okay, all right. So, yeah, I was hoping that too. Um, so, if you have a GitHub account, you can actually go and hit this fork button, and that will create your own uh, repository on GitHub that is a copy of this. And it will create a relationship between those two repositories that makes it easy to incorporate change uh, requests via pull requests, which is the next thing I'll explain. And it, these are instructions for forking the repo. So I advise you to, to go through these slides. I'm, I'm sorry that these are, these are bunched up, but this was a lot of material we, we went through. Um, a pull request basically processes, formalizes the process of incorporating changes to software. If you have a repository, like a, a fork of the example repository, and you have changes in that repository that you would like to see incorporated in the one you forked from, you can actually use GitHub to create a pull request um, that contains those changes that I could review and then incorporate. And the nice thing about this pull request mechanism is that it gives uh, GitHub an event that can trigger automatic uh, tests or other checks for the code changes, um, which is nice because those kind of automated processes can help uh, some, somebody who is evaluating a pull request make sure that the code doesn't contain changes that will introduce bugs. Um, and there is, uh, there's provisions for people to discuss the changes um, on GitHub. How much, how much more time can we take on this stuff? Um, so, okay, all right. So, so I'm gonna skip ahead because there, there are instructions here for, for submitting pull requests to, to GitHub repos and, and there is plenty of dialogue on this stuff on the resources that I've given you. One of the things that I said I was going to do that I think people are excited about is explaining continuous integration. I'm, I'm gonna skip through this process stuff because it's, it, it's complicated and uh, there's a lot of literature on it. Take a look at this stuff. Continuous integration is the idea that you can have a master branch that always works. And so, the idea is that changes only enter your repository uh, via pull requests from other people you developing in repositories, and that those pull requests trigger automated builds and tests. And so let me let me I think the best way to explain this is is to show you just how it works. And so I have a, a project called uh, Alchemia. Let's. That, that uses a continuous integration service called Travis CI that integrates with GitHub. It's free for open source projects. And the idea is that whenever you wanna make a set of changes to a repository, that change request, that pull request, can automatically initiate a, a download, a build of the source code, and running of any tests that you want to specify when you wanna uh, approve changes. And so if you guys want to, you can navigate to this link, which is a repository containing a, a project called Alchemia that I maintain uh, that basically 
uh, exposes some mature reactive transport interfaces for people who uh, understand fluid mechanics and, uh, and hydrology, but want to incorporate geochemistry into their projects. So this is just a C library maintained on GitHub. And so here's the project. You can see that the interface shows you all the source code here. And, and so there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and here are some, here's what issues look like in, in a more mature software project. This is kind of a to-do list there. Um, and if you look at the set of pull requests, there are none here, but there are 30 of these things that have been incorporated from other people, right? And if you look closely, you can see that by these pull requests, there are little green check marks or red Xs. And, and so th this pull request is basically a record of some changes that were proposed by somebody. Here's a conversation saying what the pull request was um, with the change in Git, and this is just a commit message, with a little X next to it. What is that? Well, that means that this change actually caused a failure in an, a build process that was spawned by a pull request. And we can actually go in and see what that was. Um, and, and so there are before and after synopses of, of these files. And if you click on the red X, you can actually see how this pull request contained changes that caused the build failure. So for Alchemia, we actually build two configurations on each of Mac and, and Linux boxes with various options. And setting up a Travis CI uh, instance for GitHub takes some configuring. But once you have it set up, it's nice because you actually get a complete report of what does and doesn't work. And if you click on any one of these lines, you actually get a log file that is just output that you can see uh, automatic build was triggered. And there's some compilation. And you can always make it nicer. And then you can see that the, the automated tests that I use to, to vet Alchemia failed in, in some way here, that there was a, a memory error that was triggered here. And so I, I said to the contributor, well, we need to fix this before we proceed. So many times they had builds fail to the discrepancies in version. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so you mean discrepancies in versions of third party libraries or? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. If you're relying on external software, that's, that's a whole other topic that I hope will be a, a future webinar. Um, because when you're using a, a library like HDF5 or uh, even uh, something lower level like Zlib, sometimes vision, versions of those libraries are incompatible. And if you look on what's installed in your system, it's it's not uh, it's not clear how your system differs from other people's. My own solution to this is is to incorporate those third party libraries into your own builds. But that's that's definitely a conversation for another time. Um, so let's backtrack. So this, this shows you kind of the handshake between a pull request, which is a dialogue between somebody who is contributing changes to things and, and a set of code reviewers and sets of changes with associated uh, tests that run. And this pull request didn't go through because it caused a problem that was identified by the continuous integration build. So what I want to leave you with is it's possible to automate a lot of your change process if you're willing to put it, put some time into to setting up this apparatus. So does Travis have GPU support? Um, I don't know. Travis is, most of these continuous integration platforms are not meant for high performance computing. In fact, Travis is one of the only services I have found or one of the only services I had found when I was looking 
that offered support for C and, and Fortran and C++ compilers. Um, that said, I think more people in the high performance computing uh, sector are getting excited about it. And so there, there might be options for, for Travis. I know definitely that there, the pieces to build your own continuous integration from uh, something like Amazon AWS uh, are getting easier all the time. I don't know if anybody has GPUs available yet. But definitely check this out. And this is all detailed in the slides as well. So, so take a look. Um, let's see if there's a successful pull request that, that can show that this thing, oh, here's one. Right, so you'll see there's a little check here. This pull request was merged successfully, meaning that these changes made it into the master branch of Alchemia from, from elsewhere. Um, during the pull request, you will see the tests running and you'll see a yellow light uh, if, if that Travis CI instance is actually downloading and, and building the code and testing it. And then it'll give you a nice big fat green light when everything is working properly. And so this is, this is one of those that, that worked out. Okay, so at this point, I'm just gonna wrap up. I'm sorry for, for going over. This was quite a lot of material. Um, you need version control, right? You're not gonna be taken seriously uh, if you're not using it. And the reason is it's very difficult to know what the real version of, of the code is if there's no repository, if there's no ground truth. And also it's, it's just harder to do business with people without version control. Distributed version control systems are becoming more popular because they're they're much more flexible in terms of how people collaborate with each other. Git seems to be the tool of choice in industry because you'll never outgrow it. The more you learn about it, the better. There's lots of documentation in these slides. Check them out. Learning in it is an investment, but the payoff is very real. You might want to have a Git person or two um, on your staff, but that it will take some time. Um, and GitHub and similar sites provide you with basically everything you need to do uh, for collaborative software development. The amount of stuff that you can do in the cloud, the cloud nowadays um, in terms of automating process is kind of staggering for those of us who, who had to do a lot of development and, uh, before the cloud came along and stand up our own servers and uh, maintain them and, and, and all that other stuff. Um, and there are very well studied software development processes that are enabled very easily by Git and GitHub. And continuous integration is in, in some sense, that's as good as we can do uh, these days for, for automating the stuff that you don't need uh, critical decisions on, like evaluating code changes that obviously break something. You, you want that to be easy. You, you want it to be easy for something to give you a red light and say, no way, these, these code changes have to be massaged a little bit before they make it into the main line. So, so there's a lot of stuff. Sorry to make it through everything evenly, but I hope that everybody has picked up something. Um, and that's all I have. So if there are any other questions, I'd be happy to take them. Looks like there are no more questions. Thank you, Jeff, for the webinar. Um, to all those who are still around, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, June 15th, and this will be on testing and documentation of code, and it will be given by Alicia Quinbex from Sandia National Laboratories. Um, in the meantime, the movie of this uh, webinar will be posted and uh, in the usual place uh, where all of these sessions are documented. And uh, um, I suppose this is it. See you the next time. <laughs>